Sometimes you gotta go back to the enemy to actually move forward. And I don't mean going back to reminisce or chase ghosts. I mean going back to see where you came from. Where you been, how you got here. See where you're going. In the closing months of World War II, Korea was split into two spheres of influence at the 38th parallel, occupied in the south by American troops and in the north by the Soviets. Initially, the 38th parallel was meant to be a temporary division, but with the outbreak of the Cold War, what resulted was the formation of a communist regime north of the parallel and a U.S.-oriented regime in the south. It was a Cold War and that was a big evil country and they were so big and they were in competition with the United States and no freedom, very little freedom there, lots of propaganda. We had some too, but they seemed to have more. Well, this happened in Korea, neighboring China was engulfed in a civil war between the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists. In 1949, the communists won, and Chinese leader Mao Zedong declared the creation of the People's Republic of China and diplomatically recognized the communist North Korean regime. Any hopes of peaceful reunification were smashed when in June of 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. From 1950 to 1953, a bloody and indecisive war would be fought, known as the Korean War. Though fighting subsided in 1953 with the signing of an armistice, it was not followed by a formal peace treaty. Those sorts of divisions were always intended to be temporary. The same thing happened in Vietnam, as everyone knows, okay? Um, the idea was is that you would temporarily cease the, the fighting and allow for uh, some kind of a referendum, a vote, where the people could decide which way the, they wanted the nation to go. And uh, unfortunately for the Korea's reunification has never happened. So the, the parallel today is one of the most heavily guarded and dangerous places uh, in Asia, if not the world. The United States is still technically at war with North Korea to this day. But should the U.S. intervene militarily once again? Well, the old nuclear agreement was, was referred to as MAD, okay, Mutually Assured Destruction. And Mutually Assured Destruction was the idea that if you have two opponents and each side is armed with nuclear weapons that they can deliver to the other, um, then neither side would start a war because they know starting a war would lead to their own demise ultimately. Starting a nuclear war with the South or the Japanese or with the United States would automatically result in his, his defeat. I don't think he thinks he could win, period. Well, I know the, the basic thing about nuclear weapons is that we've tolerated their presence now for a half a century, and sooner or later it's going to come back to really bite us. You can't have things that are so dangerous uh, lying around and, and, and being aware of human error and the likelihood that something can go wrong um, and think that we really are safe by having nuclear weapons. I don't think the sort of let's go in and assassinate this guy is going to solve things. It was great that we had the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which attempted to stop the spread of nuclear weapons to other nations. But in 2003, North Korea exited the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and began to reprocess spent fuel rods previously used in heavy water nuclear reactors. Uh, the genie's out of the bottle and uh, we are in a very dangerous time now with um, more countries being able to afford to pursue the nuclear option. So there, it's a real dangerous thing. The young dictator, the grandson of Kim Il-sung, as much as we portray him as a crazy guy, I think there's a strong rational streak in what he's trying to do. Maybe he's just trying to protect his country by being so, um, oh, derogatory. He's worried that uh, the West probably would engineer some kind of regime change. Is there a value in having a nuclear weapon? 
uh, in terms of keeping your regime in place, and it does seem like that is a very uh, a good way of doing it. Sanctions can be effective over the long term, sometimes, but along the way, sanctions have the tendency to really impact the most powerless people in a society. We saw this uh, um, with, with Iraq, okay? We had placed sanctions on Iraq. Um, <clears throat> Iraq ran out of medical supplies. They couldn't take care of their children. There were food shortages, all those sort of things as part of our effort to displace Saddam Hussein. Um, <clears throat> North Korea has been under pretty stiff sanctions for some time now, and the people there are suffering. Um, but North Korea, to their sort of credit in a perverse sort of way, have found ways around the, the sanctions. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that more sanctions are going to work. There needs to be a regional solution it has to be something that involves all the powers there and uh, tries to solve the problem without really the cooperation of the Chinese and the Russians, the two nations that border the North Korea and that are somewhat sympathetic to, to them, without their real rigid enforcement, I don't think sanctions will work. In Trump's style, which is uh, like his governing style here in the United States is, you know, lots of bluster, insults, um, but not the kind of patient diplomacy that might be better off solving this. I just don't think any diplomatic situation is, is pointless because if it is, then we can just, we just have to be honest with ourselves and say that our failure at diplomacy it has resulted in or will result in potentially millions of just regular people like us dying. And of course, no one would want that. So you have to persist in your optimism and you have to persist in, in working as hard as you can. I mean, I have a lot of faith in our government that democracy works. I think ultimately democracy will win. that say you can't go back. Yes, you can. They just have to live in the right place.